Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware, we have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit, but frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to For Fox Sake, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm co-host Wooden Fall for Voldy Strix Ellen, and sitting in the chair next to me is co-host Would Definitely Get Distracted in the Isles Katie. Hey! Now, eh, yeah, no, I can't actually even say that wouldn't happen, because it, it would. So, uh, let's just fly into the Phoenix flashback before I get more distracted, <laughs> shall we? <laughs> Last week, we covered the first half of Chapter 34, the Department of Mysteries, and the corresponding, albeit extremely abbreviated, film scenes. Flying on emaciated horsey birds is disconcerting to say the least, however, still better than Flying Frontier. Luna is quite the emaciated horsey bird equestrian, while Ron should probably stick to brooms. Harry spends his trip to the Department of Mysteries mentally working out the game of Clue that's been going on in his head. The security at the Ministry of Magic is a little lax after hours. Clunky elevators are not the best mode of transportation when you're trying to be stealthy. And, true to form, the Department of Mysteries lives up to its name in the books, not so much in the movie. That's just a hallway. (laughs) Yeah. The hallway of mysteries. The hallway of... It's just here. (laughs) The hallway of, oh, that's what that is. (laughs) During episode 180, Emaciated Horsey Bird Snacks, our Potter pondering was, obviously the movie section was perfectly coherent, but since it left out nearly all of the details, what would you have really liked to see from the first half of the book chapter? Also, would you fly on the back of a Thestral whether you could see it or not? Hi, Ellen and Katie. This is Megan calling in my Potter pondering. So the first part, I mean, what would I have liked to see in the movie from the first half of the chapter? I mean, I'm not much help here. All of it. (laughs) And then for the flying on a Thestral, whether I could see it or not, I love this question because my initial like gut reaction is, hell yeah, (laughs) sounds super fun. I don't care if I could see it or not. If anything, it might add a sense of, you know, more fun to it. Because, like, I like roller coasters. Um, so, not that it's the same thing. But anyway, I'm rambling. So, my gut reaction is yes, I would absolutely do that. However, in my old age, <laughs> I've noticed that I actually do get scared sometimes. So, I don't know. Maybe I would be too scared. Maybe even though I would want to, maybe I would be too scared to do it. So, I don't know. I hope not. <laughs> but it's hard to know. But, yeah, great question. And that's all that I have for you. Thanks. Hi, this is Kendra Copeland. I am calling in my Potter pondering. So I think really all I would have wanted to see in that first half of the chapter that wasn't in the movie would have been that great scene of them all smushing into the telephone booth. And I would have loved to see the badge saying rescue mission. I think that was a great little touch of humor that would have been fun to see. In regard to whether or not I would ever get onto one of those horsey birds, invisible or not, do you mean like casually? Probably not, especially because it's flying. But if I was in some kind of life or death situation and that was the only way I could go, I like to think that I would be brave enough to do it. I don't know if it would make a difference, really, if it could, if I could see it or not. I feel like feeling it would be okay, but maybe I'm just wrong. I've never, ever flown anything invisible, you know, just hasn't happened. So I don't really know, but I feel like either way, it's going to be terrifying, and I would definitely want those brown roads. All right, bye. Thank you so much for your responses. Our trivia question last week was, what does Luna think the pearly white objects drifting around in a tank of green water are? When Ginny asks if they are fish, Luna excitedly declares them to be aquavirious maggots. Ew. Sounds delightful. <laughs> She also says that her dad claims the Ministry were breeding them, but Hermione cuts her off to inform her that they are brains. Because that's way more normal. That's totally less ew. <laughs> Congratulations goes to Kalista White Wolf. Woohoo! Despite us completely forgetting to post the episode at its normal time, she was right there and ready with the answer when it did post. Mm-hmm. 
Will she be starting a new streak or will Mike have something to say about that? We shall see. For now, let's dive into the second half of Chapter 34, the Department of Mysteries, and the additionally abbreviated corresponding film scenes. Chapter 34, the Department of Mysteries, Part 2. Neville asks how they're going to get out, and Harry says it's irrelevant until they find Sirius. Hermione warns him to not go calling out for him, but Harry's instincts have been telling him to stay as quiet as possible already. Ron asks where next, and Harry says he remembers that the next room glitters and that he'll know it when he sees it, so they need to try more doors. He picks another door that leads to a long rectangular room full of low-hanging lamps. It is brighter, but not as glittery as he remembers the room he is looking for. This room contains some desks and an enormous tank of deep green liquid, big enough for them all to swim in, with pearly white objects drifting around inside. Ron asks what they are, and Ginny guesses fish, though Luna thinks they are aquavirious maggots that her dad had told her about. Hermione cuts her off as she moves closer to the tank and identifies them as brains. Harry mentions they should try another door, and Ron points out that there are doors from this room as well. Harry wonders how big the Department of Mysteries is and says they should just try another door in the first room and follow the path from his dreams. Luna starts to close the door, but Hermione tells her to wait and uses flagrate to mark the door with a fiery X. The door closes and the room spins again, but the X stays on the marked door. Harry tries another one and this time finds a larger dimly lit rectangular room that sinks into the center leaving a pit about 20 feet deep. They are standing on the top tier of what seems to be benches, similar to an amphitheater or the courtroom where Harry was tried by the Wizengamot. Instead of a chair in the middle, there's a raised stone dais holding a stone archway that looks so ancient, cracked and crumbling, that Harry is amazed it's still standing. The archway is hung with a tattered black curtain which flutters very slightly as if touched, despite the air being completely still. Harry asks who is there and scrambles down to the dais. He quietly speaks Sirius's name and has the strange feeling that someone is standing just beyond the veil. He edges around the dais, but nobody is there. Hermione calls to Harry, sounding extremely scared as she says they should go. Harry thinks the arch seems beautiful and has the urge to walk through the veil, but Hermione calls him again to leave. Though he says okay in response, he still does not move. He thinks he hears something like whispering and murmuring noises from the other side. He loudly asks what they're saying, and Hermione tells him that nobody is talking. He insists that someone behind the veil is whispering, asking if it's Ron who appears around the other side of the dais. Harry inquires if anyone else can hear them, putting his foot on the dais, and Luna says she can and that people are in there. Hermione refutes this, saying no one is in there, it's just an archway, and she sounds much more angry than warranted. She reminds Harry that they're there to save Sirius, and he kind of comes too, taking a few steps back and pulling his eyes away from the veil. He tells them to go and they move away, pulling Neville and Ginny with them, who are similarly entranced by the archway. Harry asks Hermione what she thinks the arch is. She says she doesn't know, but that she thinks it's dangerous. They mark and close the door and the room spins. The next door doesn't open when Harry pushes, and he declares it to be locked. Ron thinks that must be the door, and Hermione tries Alohomora, but it fails. Harry runs Sirius's knife down the crack in the door, but that doesn't work either, and when he looks down, he realizes that the knife has melted. Hermione decides that they should skip that door and marks it before the wall spins again. Harry pushes open the next door and finds the room from his dream. As his eyes adjust, he sees clocks of all kinds filling the room. The light is coming from a towering crystal bell jar at the far end of the room. 
Harry leads them through the room, but Ginny points out the tiny jewel-bright egg that rises through the jar and cracks open for a hummingbird to emerge. It rises to the top of the jar before its feathers become damp and bedraggled as it sinks, becoming enclosed again in its egg. Harry hurries her along as she continues to watch, and she snaps that he'd taken his time at the arch, but carries on. The next room is as high as a church and full of nothing but towering shelves covered in small, dusty glass orbs. It's lit by more candles with blue flames and is a very cold room. They move in slowly and Hermione reminds him that it's row 97. They find a number on the shelves and Hermione directs them towards the right. Harry reminds the group to keep their wands ready and as they creep along, he notices yellowing labels under the orbs. Some have a weird liquid glow, while others are as dull and dark within as blown light bulbs. They arrive at row 97, and Harry says he had seen Sirius right at the end, leading them down the row. They get to the other end, but no one is there. Harry looks around, muttering about where he might be, when Hermione speaks up to say that she doesn't think Sirius is there. The group is silent, and Harry does not want to look at them. He feels sick, not knowing why Sirius isn't there. He runs up the space at the end of the row, staring down them, then tries the other way, but there's no Sirius and no signs of a struggle. Harry hears Ron call him and responds, even though he does not want to hear Ron say that he'd been stupid or suggest that they go back to Hogwarts. He just wants to hide in the dim light and doesn't want to face the others in the bright light of the atrium. But instead, Ron asks him about something he's looking at on the shelf, wondering if Harry saw it. And Harry rushes to him, thinking it might be a sign of Sirius. Ron is looking at an orb and points out that it has Harry's name on it. The orb is dusty but glows with inner light. Harry cranes his neck to read the label and sees a date from 16 years previous, along with the words SPT to APWBD, Dark Lord and question mark, Harry Potter. Ron sounds unnerved when he asks what it is and what Harry's name is doing down there, commenting on how he and the others don't have their names on the orb labels. Harry reaches out, but Hermione says she doesn't think he should touch it. He questions this, since it has something to do with him, but Neville also thinks that Harry shouldn't and looks very apprehensive. Harry insists that it's got his name on it, and, feeling slightly reckless, he closes his finger around the dusty ball's surface. The ball feels warm like it had been lying in the sun. Harry expects, even hopes, that something dramatic is going to happen to make their trip worthwhile as he lifts the orb down. At first, nothing happens and the others move towards Harry to look as he brushes the dust away. But then, a drawling voice behind them speaks, instructing Potter to slowly turn around and give him the orb. The movie section picks up, cutting right from the black-tiled corridor into the room filled with shelves of glass orbs. Harry leads the group, all with their wands lit, as they cautiously look around. A noise causes them all to turn towards the source where they see the door closing itself. They all look at each other in silent concern, then the camera shifts to show them making their way down the aisles. As Harry whispers out a count of each row, looking for 97. As he nears it, he jogs the rest of the way to the spot where he saw his godfather being tortured and shines his wand light over the empty area, looking very confused. He turns back to his friends and declares that he should be there. The rest of the group are all looking around at the shelves and the glass spheres, and instead of responding to Harry about the lack of Sirius, Neville just continues to look up at a shelf as he informs Harry that one of the orbs has his name on it. The camera focuses on the orb as Harry approaches it, staring at the swirling smoke inside of it. He reaches out for it but hesitates and glances back at Ron and Hermione before looking back to the orb and lifting it from the shelf. A husky voice begins speaking from inside the sphere, proclaiming that the one with the power to vanquish the Dark Lord approaches, and the Dark Lord shall mark him as his equal, but he shall have power that the Dark Lord knows not. Ron and Hermione exchange troubled looks as they, as well as Ginny and Luna, look on. 
The voice continues speaking, saying that neither can live while the other survives, until Hermione calls out Harry's name and interrupts the rest. Harry hurries over in front of the group, holding the sphere in one hand and his lit wand in the other. As he raises his wand hand to illuminate the aisle, a masked figure steps into the dim light and continues to approach them. Dun dun dun! Dun dun dun! <laughs> For the most part, this is pretty similar. Sure. Obviously, we're missing details. Yeah. Obviously. For what it is, it's similar. For what it leaves out, it's not similar at all. Yeah, there are some <laughs> minor changes with the end part of this, which we'll get to when we talk about it. Yeah. But the main thing is like the whole first half of this half of the chapter is not in it. No. No, not at all. Because they literally just skipped over all of the mystery of the Department of Mysteries. I mean, basically what we're doing here is a Sorcerer's Stone end scene where we <laughs> skip all the potions, the like potion quiz and fucking what else? The troll. I'm we half skip. surprised they yeah. actually gave us that chess game, to be right. honest. <laughs> that was the only way they could work in any action. Shit. The this troll Department was of done. Mysteries was just a hallway and a door, like we said. Yeah. Hallway and a door, balls Leads on the other right side. right into balls of plenty. Yeah, it was just a big old ballroom. That's it. A ballroom full of balls. Yep, big old fact. But there were other rooms that the book tells us about. The book tells us about them, yes. There were literally no other rooms no. in the movie. <laughs> That's where it picks up, though, in the book. They just found out that that circular room with the 12 identical doors spins to fuck with you. Yeah. Where'd you come from? Where are you going to go? I don't know. Where did you come from, Cotton Eye Joe? (laughs) That started to happen, so I went with it. (laughs) I heard that. But so they went through the main door Mm -hmm. from the corridor, ended up in this round room, closed that door, and the room fucking spins. That's where it picks up. Mm -hmm. Neville's like, well, how the fuck are we going to get out of here? And (laughs) Harry's just like, that's future Harry, Ron, Hermione, Ginny, Neville, and Luna's concern. Right now, we just need to find my dog father. Yeah, it sucks to be them, but that's not on us right now. I don't know. I kind of feel like maybe you should have a plan. Have we had one up to this point, Ellen? We'll fly, of course. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just saying. I mean, seat of our pants. That's how we roll. Seat of our our horsey bird. (laughs) Seat of our invisible, emaciated horsey bird. Yeah all we do but yeah so harry is just one track mind on finding his dog father and hermione who clearly knows harry's not in ravenclaw Mm -hmm. tells him not to go shouting for him to be fair i mean i'm surprised he didn't just get into the department of mysteries and was like serious 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 where's my dog father marco (laughs) stella (laughs) Although, in reality, Harry already has the instincts that are telling him to be as quiet as possible. Yeah, Like, he was even worried about the elevator being too loud in the previous right. section. So it's just kind of like, duh, Hermione. But at the same time, when you're right in the spot that you know or you think you know that Sirius is supposed to be, I think it was intensely right of Hermione to be like, mm, maybe stay quiet plus when he thinks there's a chance he could be near serious he kind of does that anyway as exactly. we'll get to so yeah no she's not out of line exactly also it's harry and he's not in ravenclaw yeah so ron's keen to keep the party moving and he's like okay where next but all harry really knows from his dreams is that the next room is kind of glittery mm-hmm. and he doesn't really know how to describe it beyond that but says he'll know it when he sees it so they should just you know open more doors And they just randomly pick one, open it up, and it's this long rectangular room. There's some low-hanging lamps, and it is kind of brighter, but it doesn't glitter like he's expecting it to from his dream. Mm -hmm. So he's just like, this probably isn't it. But then they get a little bit distracted by what's in the room because there's this giant, I assume it's like a fish tank. Yeah, that's what I thought it was too, like an aquarium. Yeah, Yeah. it's full of this dark green liquid Mm-hmm. So maybe water, maybe some kind of potion. Maybe I a, don't know. A goo of some maybe. sort. Maybe. Perhaps. Ooze. Ooze, yes. <laughs> However, it's full of these pearly white objects that are just kind of floating around inside it. That sounds so dirty. I suppose. It's me. It all sounds dirty. Everything sounds dirty to you. It's true. This is like 
my holy grail chapter right here. <laughs> they wrote this for you. Yes. They did. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep. Ron wants to know what these pearly white floaty things are. And Ginny's like some kind of fish, which is reasonable. It's like a fish tank. As it's we like said. a fish tank. Sure. Yeah. But Luna gets super excited and starts, no, they're aquavirious maggots like my dad was telling me that the ministry's been breeding. Which was our trivia question. That it was. And also a very weird reaction to seeing like floating white jizzy things. Nothing in there says they're jizzy, Katie. (laughs) Pearly, white, floaty. A lot of that just says jizz to me. Apparently. (laughs) I don't know why. I don't know what's wrong with you. (laughs) There's really no point in trying to figure me out. There really isn't. So let's just move on. Let's do so. Hermione wants nothing to do with this description that Luna is giving and just cuts her off before she can get too involved in the other things that the ministry is breeding. And she just moves closer to the tank and says, no, they're brains. I mean, they could still be the aquavirious maggots that just look like brains. It's entirely possible. We don't know. It does make me wonder whose brains? Maybe they're growing brains. Yeah. For things. It's a mystery. It's <laughs> it's in the right place then. Yep. <laughs> so Harry's like, well, this definitely isn't the place. We should try another room. And Ron's like, well, there's doors in here, too. Should we try one of these? And Harry's over there like, how the fuck big is this place? <laughs> but he thinks they should try the doors in the first room and just follow his basic path from the dream. Sure. Like, he remembers the round room. Yeah. He of doesn't course, remember his dreams this didn't give him the spinny aspect, but... I mean, you can't have everything. Right. You know? But he remembers that round room, so he is pretty sure it's somewhere off of that room. Mm -hmm. So they make their way back out to the round room, and as Luna starts to close the door, Hermione's just like, no, wait! Because she's smart. (laughs) Sure. And she uses a spell. I'm assuming it's pronounced flagrate. That's what I did. It looks like it says flag, right? Yeah. But that sounds stupid, so I'm going to go more. That sounds like the american way to say that that's what that sounds like (laughs) yeah i just don't see any british person waving a wand and going (laughs) flat right (laughs) right that's what i'm saying it just feels very it's not american so i'm gonna go with flagrate yes That's, that's my thought there it makes the most sense regardless it makes a fiery x appear on the door Mm Hmm. and when she closes it and the room spins, the X stays in place. So now they know which door they've already tried. Yeah. Which is lucky because that could have backfired. Yeah. <laughs> that that X could have just stayed where it was while the room spun even. True. You know what I mean? Like, it's possible. We don't know. Mike wants to know why they didn't just try to open another door without closing the first one. But my theory there is that it works like one of the toolboxes where if you have the top lid closed, you can't open the drawers. But if you open the top lid, it'll let you open them. That's entirely possible. It's just the opposite where if the door is open, you can't open the other doors. So you have to close one before you can open the other since it's specifically set up to confuse you. Exactly. Like who knows? Maybe there's no door handles until all the doors are closed even. Who knows? It's a mystery. It's a mystery. I don't know. That might be the better episode title. (laughs) (laughs) So naturally, Harry tries another door because what else are you going to do? Sure. And this one, it's like the door then looks down into the room. And they're on what appears to be the top bench of kind of like an amphitheater or the Mm -hmm. courtroom where he had his trial by the Wizengamot. Yeah. So the door opens and they're basically like on the top tier looking down about 20 feet and in the very middle of this room instead of it being a chair like where he sat Mm -hmm. there's a stone archway like an ancient stone archway with a black tattered veil yeah that's moving on its own even though there's no breeze in the room whatsoever very ominous yeah and textbook yeah ominous and mysterious to the point that Harry goes straight down there and he thinks that he can hear whispering. So he's like immediately like, who's there? What's going on? Sirius, is that you? 
because apparently he listened to Hermione say, don't go calling out his name. Yeah, that's, you know. But he makes his way down to the dais and is like walking around it, essentially, like calling through it. He has this strong desire to walk through it, Mm -hmm. the veil, yeah, like the middle of the archway. And Hermione's just like, hey, maybe don't do that. Like, we should probably go. Like, this isn't a good idea. Like, this feels bad. Can we not do the thing that feels bad for once? Yeah. And Harry's just completely entranced by this archway. He thinks that it's beautiful. Like I saying, he wants to walk through it. He's mm-hmm. talking to the voices that he thinks he's hearing. Yeah. And Hermione's just like, nobody's talking, Harry. You know me. I have issues with Hermione just assuming things. that Maybe it's a fucking basilisk. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> assuming things that are and aren't there. You know, nothing's pulling the carriage, Harry. It's pulling itself like normal. Ugh. No, nobody heard any voices, Harry. Da, da, da. Like, And I know I say it every single time this comes up, but this is why I don't think that Hermione could have been a Ravenclaw because she's so close-minded when it comes yeah. to things like that. Yeah. Like, honey, you're in a magic school. For being in a magic school, you kind of don't believe in magic a right? whole lot. Like, and right now you're in the Department of Mysteries. Yeah. It's not even just that. Like, it even goes back to the brain thing. Like, yeah, they probably look like brains. That doesn't mean that's what they are. True. But that's what you're seeing. So automatically she takes this, like, kind of haughty tone about it and is like, well, obviously they're brains. Because that's the most normal answer you could give right, right now. Because that makes so much more sense than Aquavirius maggots. Exactly. As I pointed out, who's brains? Why? What's going on here? Yeah. But no, that's her common sense, comfortable answer. They have a fish tank of brains. Sure. That's way more believable and acceptable than aquavirius maggots she's a little bit of a doubting thomas like if she can't see it she can't hear it it doesn't exist and she can accept that right she can accept that something doesn't exist and the carriages are just pulling themselves for example right but somebody says no there's something there you just can't see it that's when she's like no No. that's stupid no like Anyway, sorry. I yeah. Guess. And this is one of those Harry, no, Harry, yes type situations. Because yeah. Hermione's like, nobody's talking. And he's just like, oh, yeah, there's whispering behind the veil. And he looks around and sees Ron standing on the other side because now they've all come down to investigate. Mm-hmm. And he's like, was that you talking? And Ron's like, it wasn't me. And he's like, can anybody else hear them? And Luna says that she can hear them and says there are people in there. And Hermione's just like, it's a fucking archway. There is no in there. It's an archway. But I digress once more, honestly. I will say, though, of course it's Luna who hears the voice. Right. <laughs> like, of course it is. I mean, you literally just came from a room that magically spins to confuse you as to what door you've already gone through. Yeah. And somehow you don't have a problem with the fact that even though the room is spinning and it's changing the location of the doors, you can still enter a room after the fact. And it doesn't occur to you that there could be something through the archway? Yeah. Hermione, 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 come on. You have dealt with port keys. You have dealt with flu powder. You have dealt with all sorts of weird magical shit. But there's no in there in that archway. But no, that's just an archway. Ha ha. Ha 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 ha. Obviously, it's just a design element in this room to bring everything together. Because curtains really do bring a room together, honestly. So... What? Especially tattered ones. Yeah, definitely. But the book does point out that she sounds more angry than warranted. And we do know that Hermione has a tendency to get angry when she's scared. So this isn't necessarily her being ignorant because she's not intelligent. This is her being terrified of what this thing actually is and trying to logic it away. True. And kind of being like... No, I didn't hear a creepy noise in the woods. That was right. just my imagination. Exactly I heard nothing. Exactly what she's doing. Yeah. Which in that case makes sense. Yeah. I and I think that that's what her. she does a lot. Because she mm-hmm. would do the same thing whenever he'd talk about the resurrection stone in the last book. Yeah. I think a lot of her ignorance comes from fear. I think yeah. when Sarah started rewriting the books from Hermione's perspective and really gave more background to the anxiety that she felt she had, Mm -hmm. I think that's exactly what this is. Yeah. Which is why I love what she's been doing with the stories. Yeah. And that does make a whole lot of sense. It really does. 
it's still frustrating as fuck oh, it's to me. Still definitely but... frustrating. <laughs> I mean, dealing with my own anxieties is frustrating as fuck. Dealing right. with somebody else's can just be like, God damn it. <laughs> Would you just get it together? God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, she manages to logic herself enough to keep the cool head and be like, we're here to find Sirius. Mm -hmm. We should go. And Harry's just like, yeah, OK. And he manages to pull his eyes away from the veil and actually step away from it. But he has to pull Neville and Ginny along with him because they are also similarly entranced. Yeah. They clearly hear the voices too. They know something's going on. It's really interesting to me that it's really only Ron and Hermione that don't seem to hear it. Yeah. That is a very interesting point to make. And it's interesting to me too that like maybe it has something to do with seeing death because... Neville and Luna and Harry could all see the Thestrals as well. But the fact that Ginny gets pulled into it also. Well, see, that automatically in my head, I go to, well, she was almost killed by Tom Riddle. Yeah, I have to wonder if the trauma involved in I'm wondering if it's more nearly dead. Yes, I wonder if it's more trauma related than necessarily like an absolute like death or, you know, witnessing a yeah. death maybe. Because really... Ron and Hermione, I mean, they've had, yes, they've had dramas for sure. They have, but nothing to the extent that Neville and Luna and Ginny and Harry and Harry have had. Yeah. Exactly. Like Luna essentially saw her mother explode or yeah, however whatever that, that was. Yeah. Happened. A spell went badly wrong. Exactly. Neville saw his grandfather mm -hmm. pass die, away. Mm -hmm. And then I know you guys were talking about it on the patron group. As to whether or not Neville actually saw his parents get tortured. Yeah. And yeah, we don't know that for sure. But even so, that's a trauma. Yeah. Whether given the it situation, yeah. it makes sense that his parents could have sent him to be with his grandmother for safety because they knew they might be in trouble. Exactly. They were for the followers they that were got in whatever, yeah. way and stuff like that. Exactly. But if he was there... It is entirely possible that he knew something was going on. Yeah. Regardless, he was a baby who suddenly lost his parents. Like, And he's had to go and see his parents all those times. That's a fucking trauma. That's some trauma. Like, yeah. whether or not he actually saw it happen, that is traumatic for anybody. Then you got Ginny. Who was Ginny... literally possessed by the Dark Lord, used to do horrible things. Exactly. And then essentially had all of her life sucked out of her until she was nearly dead, until mm -hmm. Harry came and saved her. So... And then there's yeah. Harry. So yeah, well, there, we don't need to He has a lot to be upset about. He has a lot to be upset about. He really does. But yeah, between the four of them, it kind of makes sense that it might be trauma related. Yeah, yeah I could see that. You know? I, I yeah. accept. <laughs> Thank you. Glad but he pulls upset. them away mm -hmm. and Harry asks Hermione because she has the answers to everything what she thinks that arch is mm -hmm. and Hermione has no clue except that she knows it's dangerous. And that's fair. Yeah. And it clearly was like to entrance them like that there's something not okay with that archway. It's mysterious. It really is. It's in the right place. It's in the right place. <laughs> but again they mark the door they close it the room spins and the next door they pick won't open. Harry's just like, oh, it's locked. And Ron's like, this has got to be it then. And Harry's just kind of like, I don't know. It's never been locked in my dream. He's like, oh, yeah, that's a dream. So Hermione tries a low Hamora, does not unlock the door. So Harry's just like, ah, Sirius is knife. You mean a low Hamora didn't unlock the door? Yeah. I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry for that. Uh-huh. Shut up. <laughs> I'm not sorry. I refuse. You don't have to be sorry. I'm never sorry. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, funny, damn it. as I was saying, Harry then tries Sirius's knife, which worked wonderfully on Umbridge's door that Olohomora sure. wouldn't work on mm -hmm. in the book, at least. <laughs> and this does not open the door either. Then when Harry looks at the knife, he realizes that the knife is gone and it's just a handle with the remnants of a melted blade. So this door done fucked it up. Yeah. Yeah. And Hermione's just like, maybe we skip this door. Yeah. 
good plan because you really don't know how to get in it anyway. Right. <laughs> and if that's what it does to a metal knife, I'd hate to think of what it would do to a person walking through it. Exactly. Yes. I also have a theory of what is in that room. I do too. Based on something we hear later. So mm-hmm. we'll bring that up then. Yeah. I have thoughts. Interestingly enough, they put the X on that door, which makes sense because you don't want to go back and try it. You want to know. Yeah. Yeah. That you've already tried this one. It won't open. We're not doing this door. Mm -hmm. But they mark it. And then the room still spins, even though they never open and close that door. Interesting. Maybe because they try? Yeah, maybe because they mess with it the moment you walk away. So maybe it's not opening and closing the door. Maybe it's just... Maybe the room has a metal detector. Like metal. (laughs) Like meddling. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Actually, no, that's really good. (laughs) M-E-D-D-L-E detector. (laughs) Oh, is that our episode title? We got options. (laughs) Katie's cracking herself up, y'all. I'm sorry. I'm just really proud. That was a good one. Thank you. It actually took a second for that one to click until you started being like meddling. And I was just like, oh, no, you did it. I like it. Thank you. I'm proud. That's high praise from you. (laughs) (laughs) We'll have to tell Len about that one. He'll approve too. Yeah. Moving on. (laughs) Yes. So the room spins because it has a metal detector. Because it has a metal detector. It's a thing. And the X stays in place. Mm -hmm. So they pick another door, open that one up, and there is the room of Harry's dreams. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, quite literally it's the glittering room mm -hmm. caused by a whole bunch of clocks like the room is filled with clocks and at the far end what's creating all of the light that's reflecting off of the clocks to give that glitteriness Mm -hmm. is this towering crystal bell jar sure and into that jar which distracts Ginny. there's this jewel egg bright egg it's probably like nice bright color yeah. I don't know what a hummingbird egg looks like. They're pretty little. I mean, I would imagine they'd be little, but it's bright. <laughs> I don't yeah. know what color they are. But I assume it's a hummingbird egg as it cracks open and a hummingbird comes out of it. That would be a good guess then. But it rises to the top of the jar. It goes from egg, like newly hatched, rises to the top of the jar, full-blown, beautiful hummingbird, Mm -hmm. and then sinks back down as its feathers kind of become damp and bedraggled again until it turns back into the egg, essentially. So that's weird. So it's time, which we learn in a bit. Mm -hmm. But I feel like that's pretty obvious. It's a room full of clocks. Right. Something's going from egg to adult, back to egg, back and forth. Yeah. That's not a phoenix. Right. It's yeah. obviously showing the passage of time in sure. some way, shape, or form. But we get a little bit more on that later. Yeah. Nonetheless, it's all still very mysterious. It is very mysterious. So there's that, yes. And Ginny wants to stop and watch the bird go back and forth from egg to bird, egg to bird. And Harry's just like, we have to move. And she's like, you hung out by that archway for long enough. Like, she wasn't doing <laughs> like she that, wasn't, yeah. too. But she still goes along because she knows they're trying to save Sirius. Right. And shockingly, I know, absolutely none of that happens in the movie. What? None of it. Not a bit. It's actually really disappointing to me. Uh, Yeah. I think it would have been cool to see the time stuff. I'm not going to lie. I would be a little bit weirded out if you were like, I'm okay with this not being in there. Well, there's that. But it would have been cool to see that transition. For sure. Also, having that little bit of background, like the mystery set up for the archway and the veil, Mm -hmm. considering how significant it becomes a little bit later. Yeah. Like, how do you not pre-introduce that to us? And how do you, like... Because all we know in the movie, which we'll talk about more when we actually get to that point, but all we know is it is a weird archway that Sirius falls through and dies. Like, (gasps) spoiler alert. But (laughs) having it here... And showing us the strange whispers and how it entranced them and how Hermione sensed that it was dangerous. Yeah. Was a really nice bit of foreshadowing that we got robbed of in the movie. Oh, entirely. And it added to the mystery of it, too. Yeah. But we're going to get there. We are. We're going to get there. And we will have plenty to say when we do. 
which is why I want this to be our pondering. I want to know what our keepers think about not getting the pre-introduction. Sure. Because then we can kind of weave that into our conversation about it later. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they go through the glittery room, as Harry does in his dreams, into this next room, which mm -hmm. is the room. The room. With the super high ceilings, like as high as a church. Mm -hmm. full of those towering shelves that are covered in all of the small dusty glass orbs yeah now this is one of the first times in the book that we're really seeing it aside from the one vision thing that he had when he fell asleep during the test mm -hmm. in the movie they've been showing us this room from the get-go when arthur was attacked it's just been balls, 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 balls to the walls. The whole fucking movie. So many balls. So many balls. Just never ending balls. I mean, I think they ended occasionally. Uh, it wasn't the whole movie. <laughs> I mean, it was enough. But anyway, this is the room. It's got more of those blue flamed candles. Mm -hmm. It's really cold. I just kind of imagine they can see their breath, which just makes it even creepier. All right little bit, sure. And they slowly move through the doorway into this room. And Hermione says, you said it was row 97, right? Mm -hmm. And they find the shelf numbers so they know which direction to go. And Hermione says, like, okay, it goes up this way. So they start making their way towards the right, mm -hmm. reading the numbers, trying to find row 97. Yeah. Which is reasonable. It's also basically where the movie does come in. What? <laughs> I know. Crazy talk. We continue the most ill-advised rescue mission in history as our heroes wind up in a giant ballroom. Balls galore. Balls. Balls everywhere. Balls to the walls. Balls to the walls. Um, how to many more windows. times can I say balls? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to the walls. Till the sweat drips down your glass orbs. It doesn't rhyme. Yeah. I was trying to be... Ellen! Come on. Balls. Mm. <laughs> Balls. Anyway. Yeah, it's a ballroom, but it's not the dancey kind of ballroom. It's not even a fun kind of ballroom, really. It's literally just full of glass balls. I feel like with enough creativity. Well. I'm just saying. I mean, yeah, sure. But I digress. I'm sure given the right kind of Saturday night, sure, why not? But moving on, it's literally just a room full of glass orbs. Or as we like to call them, balls. Balls. <laughs> shelves on shelves on stacks on racks of glass balls. Just far as the eye can see, really. Yeah. And that's not very far because it's completely dark in there as well. So they just have like their wands lit and they can see the immediate surroundings. That's about it. And the darkness makes it appear as though there are more mysterious balls. It does. It really does. And there are. Mm -hmm. So Yeah. And yeah, they're all huddled together with Harry as he starts kind of making his way down what we assume is a middle aisle. It's it's an aisle of some sort. Sure. There is an aisle. Mm -hmm. They do begin walking down it. Indubitably, yes. they do. Yes. There's a loud thudding sound that makes everyone turn. And you and I had this discussion we're not entirely sure what this sound is. We've, yeah, we settled with it being a door closing for the sake of the summary. Sure, but to me, it almost kind of sounded like an evil apparition, like when the murder munchers smoke themselves into being. Yeah, though in the book, we know that they don't arrive until after he picks up the ball. Yes, however, this is not the book. True, it's not. So it's definitely not. It is not the book. And to be fair, there's a lot of things that murder munchers do in the movie that they don't do in the book. Very true. You know, such but as ride their smoke ponies into a room. Riding sure. smoke <laughs> ponies. <laughs> anyway. Into a room full of balls. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> That's a classic right there. Something is wrong with us. A lot is wrong with us. Anyway. But as it is. The gist of it is there was a strange noise and they all looked at it. Then they go on their merry way. Basically, yes. They're just <laughs> like, that was odd. Let's keep going, gang. Yep. Harry just leading the way, searching specifically for row 97. Ding! Yeah. Look at that. Dings are fun. In the book, he specifically reminds the group to keep their wands ready. Mm-hmm. 
in the movie they're just like holding him lit it's already said like it's yeah. not they're ready yeah but harry specifically reminds them and with that they notice that the labels under the orbs say things and they're kind of yellowing so many of them have been there for a while mm -hmm. and that some of the orbs have this like weird liquid glow while others are kind of dark and dull like a blown out light bulb Mm -hmm. the movie has it kind of all like a swirling smoke type thing but it worked a little jizzy yeah you, you would know, say that a little jizzy kind of makes... <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is kind of makes me think a little bit of a pensive pensive <laughs> i know you love it when i say that but in ball form like you don't have to stick your face <laughs> i don't know i don't know it does stand to reason that it would be a similar substance like yeah because it would come from almost memory but instead of it being an actual memory it's like a vision memory yeah that's kind of where i was going which with that. could also explain why she doesn't remember doing this prophecy it could have literally been removed from her head after that true true for my, her own protection my other thought too was that it was lifted out of dumbledore's brain because he saw her make the prophecy possible and it could just literally be his memory of her yeah saying interesting i wonder how that works hmm who knows because they're not like the actual divination crystal balls no they're smaller than that they're just they're very different from yeah what it seems considering at this point we don't actually know what they are yeah we should table this yeah we should shelve this <laughs> and yeah. then pick it up later because i think this could make a good pondering once we know what they are gotcha let's go but anyway, they make their way down the rows, find row 97. Harry's just like Sirius was at the other end. Mm -hmm. So he leads him to the other end and there is no sign of Sirius. There's nothing there. No sign of a struggle. He checks the neighboring rows. Mm -hmm. Nothing. And they're all just like standing there in silence and Harry's afraid to look at them because he feels like an absolute idiot. Like sick to his stomach. Like what the fuck did I lead my friends into? Yeah. He's not here. Mm -hmm. there's no signs of anything ever being here other than these yeah. balls <laughs> these dusty ass balls these stupid dusty balls so it's just like fuck <laughs> and it's also similar in the movie so there's that yay yeah <laughs> He comes up to the spot where he saw his dog father being tortured and stops dead as there's no one there not a dicky bird. Nope, not a sign of a scuffle. Not even a tiny puddle of pee that would likely have been left by someone undergoing a torture session. Unless they wore their depends. Or their yellow robes. <laughs> <laughs> Harry looks around and he's like, what the fuck? And he just looks at the rest of the group like, he should be here. He should here. This is where he should be. This is where he was in my head. So obviously he should be here because there's no room for error on this at all. There's no way I could possibly have been wrong. He was here. I saw it. Yeah. Yeah. In the book, Ron calls to him mm -hmm. and he does answer Ron, although he's terrified to because he's afraid that Ron's going to be like, uh, you're stupid. We should just leave and get back to Hogwarts, which Ron would never say that to him in this situation. Out loud. Out loud. No. Fair enough. <laughs> He just kind of wants to hide, like, sink back into the shelves. He wants to do the Homer Simpson into the bushes thing. <laughs> yes. He doesn't want to make his way back through the atrium where the light gets really bright and they can all look at him and judge him. Mm -hmm. So he's just like, yeah. <laughs> and Ron says, have you seen this? And he's looking at something on the shelf. Harry thinks this could be a sign of his dog father's presence. So he hurries over to him. Sure. But Ron is actually looking at one of the orbs and he's like, dude, this has your name on it. Mm -hmm. And this one, it's dusty, obviously, because they all are. They do not have maintenance in there doing no, there's dusting. No they just custodial. don't. Granted, they probably run the risk of accidentally touching them and losing their mind or something. True. I don't know. Like, can yeah. you touch it with a duster or does that count? I don't. I mean, I don't know. Anyway. It's dusty, but it's got this like slight inner light and it's glowing. And Harry's mm -hmm. just like, the label says that this is 16 years old. And then it's got some weird initials, SPT. 
And if anybody couldn't identify this by sight, they're just a fucking moron. But it's A P W B D. <laughs> like, who the fuck else has those initials? Right. Like, if that's not a dead giveaway. Even if you don't know what the initials stand for, you know he's got the longest name in the goddamn book. Right. Like, come on. Oh, Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Len has never made any effort to actually memorize that. I think he does know it because he's heard me say it so many times Probably, for our yeah. cat's sake. Mm -hmm. But he loves to deliberately, he'll say Albus and he'll say Dumbledore correctly, but yeah. he loves to deliberately make up other <laughs> P, W, and B. <laughs> actually, no, that's not true. He does usually say Brian properly as well, just for the humor of it. Well, Brian is a fun one. Yeah. So, yeah. But then I accidentally, I told you this last night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah i call our cat albus yes or al mm -hmm. or alby or sometimes professor or bus Alby boy, yeah. Alby boy albs mm -hmm. and when i came home from school yesterday i walked past him and i went to just go hey random nickname for my cat and what actually came out of my mouth was hey ass <laughs> you completely just knocked out the whole middle i of just his dropped name. the oob Oop. And he just became ass. But it's really fitting for him, too, actually. <laughs> he is a sweet cat. I mean, he it's... is an asshole. So then I started calling him asshole Percival Wolfric Brian <laughs> Dumbledore. I mean, it's not not fitting for the namesake either, uh -huh. really, if yeah. we're being honest. But anyway, has nothing to do with this. No. The label also says Dark Lord and in parentheses, question mark, Harry Potter. Or if you're watching the movie, Harry Potter! <laughs> right. <sighs> Harry Potter, did you put your face in that orb? <laughs> did you put your name on the label of the did orb? <laughs> That's what it is. Yes. Ron is kind of unnerved by this. He's like, what the fuck is your name doing down here? None of us have our name down here. And as Mike points out, Harry's name is basically everywhere, Ronald. Like, <laughs> say, like, why are you surprised, bro? Are you really that shocked? Really? Yeah. Are you surprised that it's him and nobody else in this party? Really? Do you want your name down here? Right? Also, as an aside here, they looked at one shell. Right? I mean... It's a mystery. There are many other options, Ronald. Your name could be there. You never know. We don't know. Yeah, there's at least 96 other rows. Yes. <laughs> this is slightly changed from the movie as well. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Everyone else is having a look around the place because why not? And Neville calls out to Harry that one of the balls is labeled with his name. Yeah, so it's Neville, not Ron. Yep. That draws Harry's attention to his name being present in the room of mysteries. Yeah, right. <laughs> like it's a surprise. The ballroom of mysteries. Like anyone is surprised. Apparently Ron is. Apparently Ron is. But Apparently Neville is, essentially. Yeah, I it guess. It. it is definitely mysterious, though. It is. And secretly, I think Harry's like, oh, thank God this wasn't a wasted trip. Oh, man. There's still plenty of meddling to do. Woo. I was worried about that. Right. Cause, yeah. Because, you know, we got here and there was no serious. But uh, but we can still fuck some shit up. So yeah, let's go, let's guys. Do it. Let's do this. He checks on Ron and Hermione before grabbing it. But no one knows why, since their reactions wouldn't have stopped Harry in the least bit, no matter what. Like, he looks at them. But what's that going to do? <laughs> Not much. Yeah. And to be fair, they don't try to stop him. No. They just watch in silence. Yeah. Which is not how it happened in the book, but we'll get there. Not at all, no. But he grabs the smoky ball and examines it before it starts to speak. Essentially, yeah. yeah. Which is also not how it happened in the book. What? Crazy talk. We hear a husky voice that we know is being Trelawney's sexy voice. Her prophecy voice. Yes. <laughs> Starts talking from inside the orb. And we can kind of see a little face in the smoke. Yeah, in the it orb does. Too. Yeah. A little. You are in grave danger. danger. Yeah. <laughs> but she talks about the person with the power to beat Voldy is coming and they're going to have powers and stuff, which I mean, like, yeah, no shit. I don't know. I feel like this was a shit prophecy, but whatever. It's also not quite how it was worded in the book. No, but it's still kind of to the point. A little bit. Ish, like in the book, which we haven't heard it yet. So we'll talk more about it then. But this one, he's just like, it approaches. Whereas in the <laughs> book, it was specifically like, this is when he's going to be born. Yeah. So that is true. Yeah. We'll talk a little bit more about it then. Mm hmm. I'm just saying... 
this is going, oh yeah, this person's going to have powers. Like, no shit. Of course they're going to have powers are kind of necessary and all, but whatever. The others just look on as Trelawney continues speaking, ending on a line about neither being able to live while the other survives before Hermione grabs Harry's attention away from his ball. An impressive feat for a 15-year-old boy, I must say. Accurate. But she's like, Harry, shit, something's going down. Yeah. And like I said, we don't hear any part of the prophecy at this point. Mm -mm. I get why they did that, but we'll get into that a little bit more when we do actually hear the prophecy. Yeah. We still don't even know it is a prophecy. Mm -hmm. It's a dusty glass ball. To be fair, we don't even fucking know it's a prophecy when we're seeing it in the movie. We just hear words and we're like, okay. It does sound prophecy. I mean, sure. Well, again, they use Trelawney's sexy voice. Yeah. So there's that. But I, I don't know. It just seemed very open-ended as to what the hell it could yeah, be. Yeah, they could have done this part better, in they, my opinion. Hmm, they could have done a lot better, but... In our opinion. Yes. <laughs> but in the book, Harry does reach out for it, but he does not hesitate and look over at his friends for permission or mm -hmm. encouragement or whatever. He just reaches out for it because he gonna meddle. Yeah. And Hermione actually says, I don't think you should touch that. Mm -hmm. And he's like, why not? It's got my name on it. Like, bro, I mean, if the poison cupcake has your name on it, do you eat it? I mean, Crab and Goyle would. But I'm trying to make him smarter than Crab and Goyle here, Ellen. He's not in Ravenclaw. He's not. I mean, it's not like he's going to eat the orb. What harm is touching it going to do? It's got his name on it. But then you've got Neville over there looking really apprehensive. Like, I don't know, man. That might not be a good idea. Which is kind of funny because the prophecy could have been about him as well which we'll later learn yeah we can talk more about that then but it kind of makes me wonder why because they still have the question mark there mm -hmm. and dumbledore does say they relabeled it but why did it not because he attacked we'll talk about it more then we'll talk about it more then <laughs> look, i'm getting look, yeah. i'm silly goose i'm getting ahead of myself <laughs> anyway he still insists my name's on it mm -hmm. and i'm harry james meddling marie potter Right? I'm feeling slightly reckless, because that's probably also his middle name. When is he not? <laughs> right? Minus the slightly. Accurate. <laughs> he reaches out, closes his finger around the dusty ball. <laughs> oh, it's so sad when your balls are left unused and get right? dusty. Mike literally put in parentheses, Katie, eat your heart out here. <laughs> he knows me so well. Proceeds to say, the ball feels warm. That's what she said. Also in parentheses for us, I enjoy his little tidbits of information mm -hmm. and opinions and thoughts. <laughs> but it's warm despite being in a cold room like it's been lying in the sun. And that's interesting. Mysterious, you could say. That's quite mysterious indeed. That is one mysterious ball right yes. there. Yes. <laughs> Harry is really hoping that something dramatic is going to happen so it makes their trip worthwhile. <laughs> something to meddle in, exactly like you said. Yeah. That hope is there. Mm-hmm. But when he lifts the orb down, nothing really happens at all at first. Mm -hmm. And they all just sort of like come closer to him and look at the orb as he's brushing the dust away. But then... Here the we go. opposite of making the trip worthwhile happens. <laughs> and a voice speaks up. Not any voice. A drawing voice. Because despite not having a name, mm -hmm. we need a clue oh, yeah. as to who this drawing voice is. Yeah. Instructs him to slowly turn around and give him the orb. Slowly turn around and give me the orb. And by that description of drawing voice we know this is nazi von douchebag the first but we'll find out that for sure in the next chapter because this is where it ends dun 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 <laughs> this is also different in the movie harry makes his way to the front of the others palming his special ball in one hand and his wand in the other again 15 year old boy he's practiced that probably quite a bit probably he holds up his wand and shines a light on a masked murder muncher walking toward them in an appropriately menacing manner. Yeah, doesn't speak. We no. have no idea who it is. Nope. It's not like he appeared behind him as he picked up the ball the way they did it in the book. No. He's just randomly down the aisle approaching them. Yeah. 
Like, was he hiding behind a shelf the whole time? Well, see, this is why I think that was the noise that we heard earlier Could've was been. him. But they specifically showed in. the weird thing sliding to the side that I thought looked like a door. So it's just all strange. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I like to think that possibly it was Nazi von Douchebag the first apparating in on his smoke pony and then following Harry. Do you think you can apparate directly into the Department of Mysteries? I mean, if anybody can, I would think a murder muncher could. Huh. Interesting. I mean, they don't give a fuck about rules. But yeah, so hey, look, end of the movie section, end of the book chapter, sort of a similar stop. Sure. Not quite the same, but it's sure. ding adjacent. No drawling voice, but we do have a murder muncher mask. Yes. So. Yeah, so the implication is there. Exactly. Basically, shit's about to go down. Oh, it's about to go down. Book or movie, shit's going down. Shit's hitting the fan. Mm -hmm. We don't know who this murder muncher is. No. And we have a clue in the book, even if not specifically told. Yes. But regardless, since we don't know, it means there's nobody new to talk about actor and actress wise. No, not at all. So we're just going to go right on to our Potter pondering, which I already previously mentioned. I want to know your thoughts. We want to know mm -hmm. your thoughts yes. on the movie not pre-introducing the archway and the veil. Yeah. The fuck was up with that, guys? And we had several other things that we kind of pondered about throughout this episode. I feel like there was a lot of theoretical speaking yeah. and discussion that if anything struck you that you want to mention, please mention it. Of course. Find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts. Or call us at 216-526-6792 and leave your response as a voicemail. Make sure you start off telling us your name and then go into your answer. Don't forget, you can also stitch your response on TikTok. We really look forward to reading, hearing, and seeing them. And there's no Sorting Hat story this week again, but you can always send yours in to forfoxsakepodcast at gmail.com. Let us know your house, wand, Patronus, how you got into Harry Potter, and anything else you might want to share with us. Or you can message it to us over social media. This week's trivia question is... What does Harry manage to instruct Hermione to do while he's discussing the prophecy with the Death Eaters? The first one who responds with a correct answer and the code word hashtag hist directions will get a sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us through iTunes or Facebook. Make sure to email us at forfoxsakepodcast at gmail.com to let us know you did and we will get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Pod. Following us on Podbean at foxsakepod.podbean.com will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. You can also go to our website at forfoxsakepodcast.com to check out our For Fox Sake and Harry Potter related merchandise for sale. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we post our weekly podcast episodes, cooking show episodes, vlogs, bloopers, and other random videos. If you would like to support us as a patron, you can sign up on patreon.com slash foxsakepod. $2 and up a month will get you some awesome perks like For Fox Sake swag, access to patron-only Facebook groups, chats, our Discord channel, virtual hangouts, and more. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated even if it's just telling your Harry Potter friends about us. And if you don't have any Harry Potter friends, there's another reason to join our Patreon, because you will meet some of the best Harry Potter people ever. I mean, just the best people ever, really. There's that too. Period. End of sentence. And join us next week when we talk about the first half of Chapter 35, Beyond the Veil, and the corresponding film scenes. Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. And in the meantime... Keep calm and hear on! Oh, for fuck's sake.